And welcome back. You're listening to Subculture. Well, one of the smash hit shows at the Edinburgh Festival this year was, of course, Mythos Ragnarok. And now it has arrived in Melbourne and is part of the Melbourne Fringe Festival. It's one of the shows that I can't wait to check out next week. And we thought we would actually get one of the main guys from behind this amazing production on the phone right now to chat a little bit about it. Welcome to the program, Ed. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. No worries. Now, Ed, this is a show that so many of my friends have been telling me about, and I can't wait to check it out next week. I was wondering, could you tell our listeners a little bit about what they can expect to see if they head along to check out Mythos Ragnarok? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Mythos Ragnarok, honestly, is the only show of its kind in the world. Now, I think a lot of people say that about their shows, especially fringe shows. But genuinely, this is a, a world first whereby we tell Nordic mythology, but using a cast of professional wrestlers. Now, I don't know if you know too much about Nordic mythology or mythology in general, but quite often the characters and stories within mythology involve sort of large, oversized creatures and monsters and gods and heroes sort of bashing one another over trinkets or glory or whatever it might be um and it occurred to me that that sounds an awful lot like modern day pro wrestling yeah. so what i've done is strip out the pretend sport element from wrestling and instead we use these incredible modern day superheroes that are professional wrestlers to bring gods and monsters to life in a mythological context so, and so when you first started to think of the idea did you start to think of wrestlers straight away that you thought would be perfect for this or how did you go about finding your cast Absolutely. It more or less created itself. So I was, I've been a wrestler for most of my life, as have most of the people on the show. Um, and as I started looking for other things I could do as a wrestler, other ways I could use the performance art of wrestling, it occurred to me that I was surrounded by people who, if you looked, you know, looked at them sideways, didn't look too far removed from Thor or from Odin or from Zeus, you know, if you were looking into other mythologies. They're big, burly people with, you know, incredible skill sets and the way that wrestlers present themselves is as people with superpowers. You, you can't actually fight like a professional wrestler in real life. So um, I didn't think it was a too far of a cry. The, the, the people themselves looked so much like real life gods to me that I thought we should create an environment where we get to see them be that. Awesome. So where did your fascination with Norse mythology come from? I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. It's something that I just realized I knew an awful lot about by about the age of 15. Yep. Um, I it hadn't really made it into pop culture by that point, but there was I as a little 15-year-old boy carving rooms into things and visiting ancient historical sites. Uh, I wasn't the average 15-year-old boy. I don't think I was very cool. Um, but, you know, I, over time... My fascination with it grew. I ended up studying ancient Icelandic as part of a module I did at university to try and translate the text and understand myself a bit better what these stories are all about. And then, lo and behold, got about 10 years ago, it really broke into the mainstream with Vikings and the God of War series of video games and so on. Um, and that really helped me because it meant that, I, I mean, I've wanted to tell these stories my whole life, but now there seem to be other people who want to listen to me tell them. So it's been a huge benefit. Definitely. And where did your love for wrestling come from? Was that something you were always fascinated with as a child as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I started wrestling when I was 16 um, in London, and I've, I've done it for 20 years now, on and off. But um, wrestling is, I mean, no theatre is an easy way to make a living. Wrestling certainly isn't an easy way to make a living, but... Um, uh, it's just once you start doing it, you, Dave, you can't really stop. It sort of gets in your blood, as, as most performance arts do. Um, but nevertheless, I love wrestling itself, actually doing the wrestling. But the industry itself, I started to get tired of it. I, I started to get tired of all of us being underappreciated uh, and underpaid and beaten up for really no benefit. So I thought, hey, there's a bunch of incredibly talented people here, amazing performers who can do things that most other performers can't do. And really, uh, you know, what's a better way to show them off than just pretending that they're having wrestling matches every night? Now, one of the things I love in the press notes, this made me laugh. It says, this is not just two guys bashing each other on stage. There is an actual storyline. I love that line. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about how you develop the script and the storyline for this. 
Well, yeah, I, mean, I don't think I wrote that press release, so I really enjoy listening to how other people describe my show. It's, it's <laughs> fascinating. Um, but no, it's, that's absolutely accurate. The, the show itself, although there are wrestlers in it and there's wrestling in it, it's a play. So, you know, it's an end-to-end -end story that starts at the beginning, works its way through the middle, and then reaches some kind of a conclusion, which is joyful. Um, but the storyline itself essentially takes a variety of Nordic myths, some that are very popular and well-known and some that are a bit more esoteric, and then combines them into like an end-to-end -end story, as if all these things happened in a row as one uh, one plot, you know, rather than jumping around here, there, and everywhere as the myths themselves actually do. So it's sort of my way of contextualizing some of these ancient stories, answering some of the questions I have about them as someone who's, who sort of studied them and shared them, um, and put my own spin on them to try and encourage people to engage more with it's a really big part of our history you know these nordic myths definitely now of course the crossover between art and wrestling we've seen it expand over the years with people like john cena and dwayne johnson becoming household names what was the reaction to the wrestlers when you approached them about doing this theater show were they were they quite open to it and excited about it there was certainly an element of trepidation. Um, you know, wrestlers are very, very used to performing, but they don't often have to speak. And even when they do speak, they certainly don't have to remember lines. And even when they remember lines, they don't necessarily have to do that halfway through a match or having been dropped on their head or whatever. Yeah. The idea of going out doing a wrestling match and then having to deliver a series of lines that you need to get right and then maybe do another wrestling match, um, you know, is daunting to anybody. But I, I was certain they could do it, but, you know... In the end, there was only way, one way of doing it properly, and that was to do it myself first to make sure that it was doable. So I cast myself into the show, gave myself the most lines to make sure if I could do it, I figured everyone else could. So we took it from there, and some of the guys who'd never delivered a line before, you know, they've now done 100 performances, and now they've got, you know, 50 lines where they used to have one because they're developing every time they perform. So truly, when people come and see the show, they're, they're witnessing a, a new sort of use of, of wrestling and a new art form, really, in its, in its genesis. This is something we're still developing. Definitely. And how do you keep your body in shape for a production like this? Because, of course, doing it night after night, you must end up bruised or sore at different times. And, of course, if you fall the wrong way, you could hurt yourself quite badly. How do you stay in shape and keep your body from hurting when you're doing this production night after night? Yeah, well, I mean, the easiest answer is you don't, you know, you're just going to hurt. It's a, it's a rough way to make a living. But what's amazing is that uh, as long as our show is, you know, it's about is what the version we're doing here is 70 minutes long. Um, it's actually much less physical than just wrestling is. So yeah. anyone who's ever made a living as a professional wrestler is very used to this. This is just something you sort of harden up to. But my show actually involves getting beaten up a lot less. Now, the downside, obviously, is you have to do it every evening. And obviously, there's an element of choreography. And that means that whatever knocks and falls you're taking, you're taking the same one every single evening. So even if it's not that big of a deal, once you've done it 30 times in a row, things start hurting. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the main thing is you sort of toughen up to it, you get used to it, and if something hurts too much, you change it or you fall differently. One of the joys of working with pro wrestlers is that they're just, they're just so adaptable. You know, if, if in other forms of theater, the choreography is the choreography, and you have to do it because that's what's set. In wrestling, you can change it on the fly if you need to if something hurts or if you're not in the right place you just say something to the guy you're working with or give him a nudge and you do something different it's wonderful in that way awesome now i guess the big question a lot of our listeners are probably wondering is is this a show for the entire family <laughs> well we, we have had every everyone in this audience from from gray bearded academics all the way down to actual streaming babies which i mean i don't know how a show could be unsuitable for a baby they have no idea what's going on but i would implore people not to bring their screaming babies along because it's very difficult to act over the top of a screaming baby but other than babies i'm pretty sure it's suitable for the whole the whole family we tend to put a uh, uh, an advisory of a 12, uh, yeah. a PG-12 on it, just because, you know, there's a lot of fighting and violence primarily. There's a couple of swear words in there. But we've had five-year-olds come along who've absolutely loved it. We've had 10-year-olds. 10 seems to be a really good age where people have worked out what's going on and they want to they wanna watch. Um, anything younger than that is quite a long time to sit still for. But honestly, yeah, we've had absolutely everybody through our doors. And thus far, they all seem to enjoy themselves. Amazing. Now, for all of our listeners out there, Mythos Ragnarok is on until Sunday the 29th of October at the Festival Park, The Bunker, 
uh, as part of Melbourne Fringe. Now, all yes. tic- or you can grab your tickets online at melbournefringe.com.au and we'll also put a, a link up there from our website uh, to that as well so people can grab tickets. Ed, to finish off, what would you like to say to people out there who are about to head along and check out this amazing show? Oh, well, first I say thank you very much. Honestly, um, the support... It always goes a long way for any artist, let alone at a Fringe Festival. But in this particular case, I brought 10 people over to Australia from London. Um, It's not a small scale operation and trying to pull that off in a car park uh, (laughs) has been a challenge. We're having a great time, but like you just said, it's in a place called Festival Park in a venue called The Bunker. Nobody's ever heard of that because it didn't exist until two weeks ago. So if you come looking for the show, it's near Queen Victoria Market. Look for the big domed tents. And if you find it, then yeah, you're in. You're in for a in for a good night out because I promise you there is genuinely no show like it. And you'll meet me there. I'll be. I'm inside. I'm outside. I'm in the show. Um, so if you don't like it, you just find me and and we'll we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs>